Today, we're going to use Lightwave's procedural nodes, and all we're going to do is take one object and put it on the points of another. Let's hide what we're not going to use. Select the camera. I'm using this LD Viz Hide Selected script, which used to be OD, I think. So select that, and then we'll select the lights and do the same there. I'm using Lightwave 2024.1, so under this Items tab, you should see this Pro Geo drop down, and let's just select a sphere. With the sphere selected, we'll press P for properties, and you'll notice that this procedural geometry node has been added. Let's delete this because we're not going to use that for now. Double click this to go into the nodes. Here's our sphere. We can change all the settings here. We'll just leave it on two levels. Select both of these, right mouse click and duplicate. And it will duplicate those nodes and have them connected, which is super handy. So let's plug this one in and we're just going to turn this primitive from a sphere into a cube. And we're going to put this cube on the points of that sphere. So let's take this down in size. And while we're here, because we can, we'll select those two and we'll change the color to keep those grouped. We'll plug the sphere back in. So the question is, how do we get that cube onto these points? Now I found this out purely by fumbling about. So if anyone has a, an alternative setup, then please feel free to share. <laughs> these are the nodes we're gonna be dealing with and we're gonna get two nodes to begin with. We'll get the data geometry and we'll get a for loop. Now, as far as I've been able to work out, if you need more than one of anything, you're gonna need a for loop. We'll get the setup out of the way first. So we'll take the cube into the procedural geometry of the for loop and the result into the procedural output like that. Next, we'll take the loop output from the for loop into our cube, which is this. Next, we're gonna take the sphere and we'll put the result of the primitive into this data geometry in the geometry slot. We're gonna take the count into the index. Now, I want each of these points from the sphere, so I'm gonna take the point output and put it into the position of the cube. You'll see that little cube has jumped to this point here. Let's open the for loop and we'll see this start and end point. If we move this end value around, you can see that this cube is being put on those points, which is exactly what we want, but we don't wanna be second guessing what this value is here, especially if we were to change this sphere to say like a cylinder or whatever mesh you're using. So there's just a couple more nodes we need to finish this section off. We're going for a filter geometry, which is this one, and it's got a yellow output and we feed that yellow output into an info geometry, which is this one. Let's open up the filter geometry. Now what we need is this sphere in this filter geometry node. Now I found this drop down is a little bit flaky. It should contain this primitive and also the cube, I think. It should anyway, it does sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. So the best thing I found, if we double click on this cube, is to actually name this Let's call it base for instance. Let's double click on that and copy it. And now one of them is the sphere and one of them is the cube. It hasn't picked up on the uh, name change that I've just made. So I'm just gonna paste it over the top. So this name now references this sphere or at least it should. So I'm gonna take the point count out of that into the end of this for loop. And this should now attach a cube to each point of that sphere. Now you may need to include the end, or you might not. You may not wanna see the original base object or the sphere in this case, so we'll just unhook it from the procedural input. And there we go. These procedural geometry inputs seem to be similar to sort of deltas and it'll just pass the geometry through. So you could just plug it into this one and get the same result. So whatever's tidier or makes sense to you, I'm, I'm assuming. This is what that setup looks like. I guess if we select these, we could also add them into a frame. We have cubes on the points of the sphere, but how do we scatter these cubes across its surface? Let's grab a scatter points node to begin with and also an integer node. Remove the filter geometry and info geometry nodes because we're not gonna need those. 
We'll remove the cube for a second just so we can see what's going on. We're going to change from texture shaded to vertices. We'll come out of our primitive, which is the sphere, into the scatter geometry. And we'll put the result in the data so we can get the point positions of these. And we'll also replace this. So we can see if we open up this scatter node, you can see loads of points being created. We could just keep it on textured shaded and turn them into polygons, which could be very useful if you're creating star fields and you just want dots. We'll keep it on for now just so we can see what's going on. A quick note and a feature request for this scatter points node, it would be nice to have a seed input. So if we don't like the position of the points, we can change them. Plug a cube back in and there they are. Now all we want to do is marry the count number and the end number together because they're currently two different things. You could keep them separately, but I'm going to keep them together. So integer into the count, integer into the end point, and we'll move this to a figure that we're happy with. To get our original sphere back, we're going to copy and paste this add geometry node. There we go, not duplicate, otherwise we'd get it all hooked up. And we don't want that. We just want to take the result into the geometry and the result from the add geometry into procedural geometry, and it should combine the two. Lovely. This is a weird one. Let's get a random scalar node. And on my numeric keyboard, I will press the plus key and it'll automatically add an add node, which is a handy new workflow feature. We'll take the count into the add and the result into the seed. We're just gonna slap any old number in here. And we'll go from 0.5 to let's say three. And we'll plug that into the scale. But this is weird in that initially everything disappears. But if you nudge the timeline, you'll notice it updates. So if I make a change to the seed here, nothing happens, but I've got to tweak the timeline. If I turn on Studio Live, it doesn't have any effect. You've still got to go in and tweak the timeline. And the same in rotation as well. If you're expecting something to update and it doesn't, try giving the timeline a bit of a nudge. How is this useful that we're using objects on the surface rather than, say, instances? Well, that's a very good question. One of the most immediate advantages, though, is that it does work well with displacements. So if I put a textured displacement on there, Now, as you can see, the object is nicely deforming as one piece. So a lot of lovely procedural flexibility here. So as a quick blast on this one, let's hit the tidy nodes button and we'll make that full screen for you to take a peek at. Oh, that's tidy. <laughs> there you go, that's better. Here's a weird issue you may come across. I've put this texture displacement after the procedural geometry, which is what you'd expect. But if you scrub the timeline, you get this weird jumping, which is not very nice at all. Strangely though, which I found totally out of accident, if I move this texture displacement to the top of the stack, everything is now rock steady. So this doesn't make any sense to me because in this order, there is no geometry at that point for it to displace. But look, I've turned off the procedural geometry and it's still there for some reason. So I'm not sure what's going on there. So if you come across this, move the displacements to the top of the stack to avoid this jumping. So yeah, something strange going on there. Oh. Quick one on using instances rather than meshes. I just have this very simple object which I'm gonna send off to layout. There it is, it's in there somewhere. Let's just uh, double check. Yep, there it is. Let's just turn it off and turn it off from the renderer and let's turn the sphere back on. So from the procedural geometry, let's get an add instance. It's exactly the same as the add geometry node. 
what I've noticed, you can't actually instance this primitive from within itself, as it were. So if I were just to replace all of this with the same inputs, nudge the timeline a little bit, you notice that nothing has updated. So instead of a primitive geometry, let's delete that, we'll get a mesh from mesh. There we go. Let's double click on this and select our arrow. And we use that result as the geometry for that instance. It looks a bit of a wiry mess, so I'm gonna take the scale down for a kickoff. Nudge the timeline. Let's unhook the rotations. Nudge the timeline again. And we'll see it's all bound in boxes. We'll press P to bring up the properties and we'll go to the instance tab. And we'll make sure the sphere is selected. And when we add an add instance procedural node, this procedural node instancer should have been added for us automatically. We'll double click on that. Draw type will change from bounding box to textured. Nudge the timeline again. And there we go, there's our arrows. Now we've got a whole additional level of control in here. I've yet to play with it, so have a go. And let's go back to the procedural nodes. This data geometry node has a normals output. What would be lovely would be if I knew a way to convert the normals into rotations, and I don't. So, <laughs> so if anyone's got the secret source for that, then please share, that would be much appreciated. So for now, I'm just gonna select these two, duplicate them. Ooh, didn't do it quite right. Let's try it again, uh, sort of like that. And this scatter points node also has, if you notice, an offset. So we could just raise that. There we go. A nice orbit of arrows, great. But for the same token, I guess we could always reduce the size of the actual ball anyway. So there's lots to play with there, lots of flexibility. Finally, why would you use instances here rather than as an instance generator. Well, let's find out. Let's remove everything we don't want so we're just left with the points. So that's very straightforward. And then I'm gonna close that. I'm gonna remove the procedural geometry instancer. I very much recommend you saving it at this point because I've had a crash when adding this. So instance generator, yeah, we're good. That's a relief, let's see how far we get. So let's go and add the arrow, select the arrow, add it to the points. And you're off to the races. In this case then, there are no advantages. <laughs> Just keep on using the instance generator. A lot to pick apart. I'll be interested to see what people come up with.